Kurdistan has its own flag, its own president, its own prime minister, and even its own army, the Peshmerga. But if no one knew where Erbil, the capital, was, they certainly do now. First, it was the U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry. Now, it's the turn of the U.K. Foreign Secretary, William Hague. The West is trying to push the Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki, a Shia, to have an all-inclusive government that will have both the Kurds and the Sunnis in it. But there is a problem for that. One is, the Kurds do not see themselves as Arabs. They think they have a completely different national identity. The second is history. This road leads to Tikrit, Saddam Hussein's hometown, and the Kurds can never forget 1988 Halabja, when he used chemical weapons to bomb them, killing from 5,000 to 20,000 people. The Kurds are protected by their own army, the Peshmerga, and we travel about 130 kilometers from Erbil to Kirkuk and beyond to the front line with the IS. Kirkuk is a town that is historically linked to the Kurds, though it is outside their autonomous region. The Kurds use the crisis and the Iraqi army vanishing to take over the oil-rich city, a move that is welcomed by Kurds in the city. The, uh, the Peshmerga, the Kurdish army, is in control of Kirkuk. And what that does is it adds Kirkuk to the regional autonomous area that the Kurds already have and adds another step in what they are looking forward to, which is independence. They currently have uh, autonomy. The president, Masoud Barzani, has gone on to say this is our land and it will be our land forever. So they are moving towards that, even though the West is trying to get the Kurds to participate in an all-inclusive government. That yearning has found an opportunistic moment in history to move the Kurds closer to independence and the Peshmerga are the bulwark that could force the issue. When we looked at how Daesh moved from Syria to Mosul and down uh -huh. to Tikrit and Baghdad in two, three days, uh -huh. Uh -huh. how has the Peshmerga been able to keep the whole of Kurdistan uh -huh. completely safe? Uh, uh, as a kind of Hukmati Federal Iraq, his Bergiri Horagrish and Penaker and Nan to any Macau Mopkin, then Habir and Raker Dinkerdo. Mm -hmm. Balam Emma, Wokutum Jawazla, and Emma Birman Labergiri Kerdinkerdo, or Homan Amadeker Boyka de Fabkin, or Homan Bashet Kerdin, Lepenai, Oikanehel in the Jogan Boy, Binit Emalera Stop Manker Dun was Sanuman and Behisho Raganad in Bissan or Sharikar Kuko. So, General, in the end, Peshmerga win? Yes. Peshmerga is a brief man. Okay. That's the Kurdistan the Peshmerga are protecting, where Shia, Sunni, and Kurds live side by side. Minority Christians are also free to practice in the region that is booming with economic potential. And the front line, manned by Peshmerga forces, all along this ridge you can see, is where they are holding fort. The general who we just spoke to said that the ISIS or ISIL militants had attempted to get down this road at least twice before and they were beaten off. Peshmerga people are Musla, our body, Garbieti or Sharkaketi. Peshmerga General Hikmet Helgud outlines the border that his force has secured. In his war room, we get an idea of the 1500 kilometer long front that the Islamic State is trying to breach in Kirkuk in the northeast and Mosul in the northwest, from the Syrian border to the Iranian border. They have enough, uh, they have the equipment that they need, heavy weaponry, artillery. Mm. Ah, you don't need equipment, you need the heart. No, he said we have, but we have that also. That's also. more, more ah. powerful. Right. Ah. Right. The heart of the Peshmerga keeps the soul of the Kurds safe. And not worried about the Daesh at all? Yeah. This is the North Oil Company in Kirkuk and we've spent about an hour and a half on the road from Erbil to here. The highway of course leads onwards down south towards Tikrit and Baghdad. But traffic of course has been stopped because of the presence of ISIS and ISIL militants. Also what's been stopped as you can see there is oil production. There are no flares or fires in the oil refinery in the NOC area. That's because 
Baghdad does not want the Kurds to export oil through Turkey as they have been doing so in the recent past because that will only further give them an impetus towards the independence that they want. But the question is whether it's going to be a peaceful path or a very bloody path. The declaration of a caliphate, now, there seems to be one view, which is that it's the most significant jihadist declaration since 9-11, and another view that it could be a lot of propaganda, a lot of bluster. I think, I think it's too early to say that, that, that the country's fallen apart. The ordeal for the 46 Indian nurses began when they were stranded in the Tikrit teaching hospital compound, and then further on, another 60 kilometers, and once they finally got into Erbil city, it's a question of reaching the airport. And that ordeal finally nearing an end with a flight back home and a reunion with family. Uh, my daughter, when she saw me, she was crying. And uh, my son, uh, he was very happy. And he was saying that he is dreaming that uh, he was sleeping with me. And when he got up in the morning, I was not with him. So he was worried. Now he's telling, no need to dream. Now you are with me. Now I can hug and sleep with me, with you. It isn't just the nurses and construction workers in unsafe places. The government has helped over 2,000 Indians return with emergency documents and flight tickets. The new government in Delhi dealing with its first international crisis. But Kurdish officials feel India can still enlarge its small footprint in the region. Why in your mind is India missing these opportunities? Maybe for the lack of information about Kurdistan, for the lack of not engaging with Kurdistan, and seeing everything through the Iraqi angle. This is, I don't think this is helpful because Kurdistan is different from that what is called Iraq. Kurdistan is an open society, it's very safe. And India has a long tradition of working through capitals, but now the time has come to look at Iraq in a diversity way, in a, in a diverse way. And once um, uh, improvement of life has to come to the rest of Iraq, Indian companies will be able to use Kurdistan as a, as a springboard for the rest of Iraq, as a market. We travel north towards Dohuk, where the impact of the human displacement from Mosul can be felt. The landscape changes to winding roads as we move to the more mountainous north. The impact of the crisis clearly visible by serpentine queues for petrol. Little were we to know how the locals are playing God. Literally, a bridge over troubled water for the thousands displaced. Nestles in the hills in Shikhan, about 130 kilometers from Erbil, among their livestock is Karakosh. The Christian minority presence clearly visible on the houses of this sleepy, quaint town. But within the dusty tracks, it's secret. A church that's playing host to those who have fled the fighting. <laughs> The UN, the World Food Programme and other agencies, angelic saviors to these families who have no hope of returning home. Every household gets at minimum 15 kgs of this, 25 kgs of flour and the, and the food package. So some get twice that. As their names are called, they come through this, this uh, gateway here. They bring their ID cards and they, they sign to prove who they are and how many in their family. They take a small slip, um, which gives them access to X amount of food parcels. It's the same story for Shias and Sunni Kurds who have fled the fighting. Some with only the time to save themselves and their families with whatever they could load in their cars. Others had to walk with just the clothes on their back. Those were the lucky ones, with family and friends to give them a roof over their head. Then there are those who have to live in dust bowls of camps like this one in Khazir, 
a few dozen kilometers from the Islamic State stronghold of Mosul. Here, just canvas tents, portable toilets and hand pumps for water. Fez and his family are desperate, they tell us. Metab is angry but grateful. But his emotions come tumbling out. His tears a testament to what he is sure is a bleak future. A human cost clearly visible in camps like this that are dotted around Kurdistan. And their point is that they thank the government because this is the only option they say they have, either to come here or join the militants. The human costs of the bloody battles are measured by not only those killed in crossfire, but also by one of the worst humanitarian crises in recent time. And as in human caused disasters of these kinds, what we call war, while the adults try as best to cope with the tumultuous times, it's for the children, most oblivious of the present, one can only hope for a peaceful future.